Welcome to this session which is called Scramble for Africa. Um, as people will be aware, the United States is spreading the war on terror from the Middle East to, um, to the South, to North Africa and Saharan Africa. Um, in recent years, African nations have sought to diversify their economies by increasing trade and cooperation with countries such as China and Latin America. This is totally intolerable to the United States and the rest of the West who want to preserve and restore the domination of African economies through the World Bank and the um, IMF. Um, this lies behind imperialism's increased intervention in Africa, which is, United, which is led by the United States. So we're seeing um, drone bases being built, the establishment of AFRICOM, um, a pro-US military forces being built up. But there's also a division of labour and the former colonial masters of Britain and France have their role to play. Um, France and Britain are attempting to recolonise Africa with latest interventions, latest, latest interventions. This started with Libya in 2011, where NATO forces, um, led up by the by the French military, killed 30,000 people, dropping tens of thousands of bombs. And for the reward, it, re, the reward of the French, the reward for French for the French. Uh, companies in this was 30% of oil contracts um, from Libya went to France. Now we, we now we are seeing intervention in Mali with the French leading a military assault which Britain just last week um, announced that it would it would be supporting through sending hundreds of troop troops. Um, France and Britain have spent centuries trying to plunder the resources of Africa um, and Africa still has a lot of resources today nothing has changed the interventions that we're seeing at the moment are all about uh, the self-interest of imperialism, the self-interest of uh, Britain and France. Um, I'd just like to um, invite some brilliant speakers here to today, starting with Victoria Britain, who is a journalist. Well, hello everybody. Um, when uh, we spoke together about uh, how we were going to organise. Oh God! <laughs> when we when we started talking, Copy and I about this uh, expo and I about uh, this session, we were assuming it would be a small, <laughs> slightly university seminarish type <laughs> event. Um, however, we will try to rise to the occasion. Um, Although I think that um, <coughs> it's, it's very hard to put this into the kind of uh, framework that um, is sometimes put. Anyway, uh, let me just briefly um, say how pleased I am to be speaking with him. Um, we have a, a certain West African past in common. Um, Mine is more francophone and his is more anglophone, but we were both in the 80s involved in two very important and ultimately doomed anti-imperialist regimes. Um, his in Ghana, I was also, sorry? There is no microphone. Sorry, we don't have any microphones. I'm speaking as loudly as I can. If there's anyone who normally doesn't hear well, come come a bit forward. But otherwise, interrupt me again. Um, sorry, so I was just. Can you introduce the other speaker because you keep referring to he and him. We don't oh, I'm sorry. It's, e it's excellent. We can't see him. <laughs> okay, this is he. <laughs> what is his name? Explore Nani Kofi, a long time member of the National Steering Committee of the Stop the Whole Coalition. Can, Can you hear me at the back? One please, suggestion. please. Oh. One suggestion, perhaps, seeing as the room is much longer this way, if you could move all round. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I just request that people don't interrupt the speakers and we can, if you can't hear, please try and come. There is some space at the front, but otherwise, I'm afraid it's just a very popular session and. We're going to have to deal with the technical difficulties we've got with no microphones. Okay, I just want to say, I don't mind being interrupted. If you can't hear, just interrupt me politely, okay? <laughs> so what I wanted to say was, uh, before we begin properly, is that Explo was involved in the mid-80s 
Ghanaian anti-imperialist short-lived experiment. I was involved partly in that, but also in Burkina Faso. I was the translator for Sankara, um, who, as you all know, was murdered by imperialism. Um, before that, I lived in Algeria um, for some two years. So I had ca come into West Africa with an anti-imperialist training of living in Algeria, which was very, very important for me, particularly as I was coming from Vietnam, where I had been in a state of total shock and confusion when I saw what imperialism actually did. So that's just to give us a wee bit of you a background on, on who we are. Um, I want to start <coughs> in March um, 2012 when I turned on my radio <coughs> and to my absolute astonishment I heard an American accent of Captain Amadou Saya Sanogo announcing that he had taken over in Mali. In all the years I've been to Mali, I never met anybody speaking English. I certainly ne never met a Malian army officer speaking American. It was a wake-up call for me of what the blowback of American involvement in the great experiment of AFRICOM had done for Mali. The United States has spent a billion dollars in Mali in the last decade. Sonoga himself went on six sophisticated military training missions in the United States of several months between 98 and 2010. However, just to give you an idea of how incompetent, ambitious, and outrageous the American experiment of AFRICOM was. I think Sanogo is a brilliant example. This was someone who failed all his exams, who was actually dismissed as an officer for his involvement in a very shocking hazing incident. And the coup that he was announcing on the, on the radio was actually a complete accident. Some discontented soldiers decided to march to the presidential palace to describe their discontent with their salaries, with corruption, and so on. And he, having lost his job as an officer, kind of went along with them. And he was a kind of affable guy. And they, oh, great, let's go together. When they got to the presidential palace, the president ran away. Ooh, let's take power. It was that kind of a coup. So that gives you an idea of the kind of person and the kind of scenario that AFRICOM had inserted itself into. Sorry about this, I have to drink because I'm doing them with shouting. <laughs> now Mali, when I was thinking about listening to all of that, Mali for me, Mali was the country half a century before of Modiba Keita, one of the great figures of <coughs> francophone independent Africa. Mali at that time was a place of tremendous culture, tremendous sophistication. It had art, it had architecture, it had photography, it had writers, it had a very, very high achieving <coughs> educational system which went way back to the history that you've heard about in Timbuktu many generations ago. At the same time, the great achievement of the Kaita period was the unity that he had forged in Mali between all these different ethnicities, the Bambara in the south, in the north the Bozo fishermen, the Songhai peasants, and he even succeeded in getting the Tuaregs to free their Bella slaves, Bella from the Niger Valley. In fact, to, for, for, for me, because I'd previously lived for five years in East Africa, Kaita was a kind of a Francophone Nereri, who, if you remember, was the person who not only um, got the whole of Tanzania to 
to speak Swahili, but also spent his time, a lot of his time when he wasn't um, being a head of state, translating Shakespeare into Swahili. This is the kind of figures we're talking about. Of course, he was overthrown by a coup. And what came next was a series of dictatorships, all marked by neglect and marginalization of the North. And I want to just mention here that only half of the North is Tuareg. By the mid-1980s, when I was visiting Mali, it was visible, the catastrophe of structured adjustment for the IMF, the whole neoliberal program, uh, the liberalization of cotton, the impoverishment of society as schools and health services declined, an incredible degradation of the uh, environment and increasing desertification. And over the decades after <coughs> that, what you had was increasing tensions over access to land, to arable land, declining relations between crop farmers and herdsmen, and very significant competition for water. At the same time, in Europe, we were busy blocking emigration, which had been a very important source of revenue for Mali, of, <coughs> from its er emigrants mostly in France. At the same time, the political class in Mali went into a very sharp decline, as did the army both incompetence and its ability to have credibility with the population. Now, into this very complex and fractured body politics stepped those big boots of US military ambitions and that spending of the billion dollars. Now, Expo is going to talk later about China and some of the wider things, but I'm just sticking on Mali. So, as this went on, Mali became, like Guinea-Bissau, a very significant corridor for hard drugs from South America to Europe and America. And with that, of course, came, as in Mexico, corruption and violence. At the same time, you had a flood of Islamist returnees from Saudi, the Saudi and CIA-financed war in Afghanistan same time you had an overlap with the GIA in neighboring Algeria and a kind of economy that became based on things like kidnapping, smuggling, a general zone of lawlessness. Then you had NATO's appalling adventure in Libya and one of the results of that as we <coughs> mentioned earlier today was the return to Mali of Tuaregs who had been an important part of the Gaddafi war machine, plus extremely sophisticated weapons from both America and Europe, which had also been part of all of that. So into this <coughs> lawless zone, you had a lot of lawless new Malians coming back, and you also had a lot of foreigners. And the Mayans came back with their old dreams of an independent Tuareg state, Azawad. And others came with the jihadist perspectives of uh, Islamic, uh, um, Al Qaeda in the Islamic Madrid, Mojwa, and Ansadin. But I'm not going to go into that. But there was another strand of that was they wanted revenge on Bamako for the marginalization of their region. Now, to come to the, our attitudes to the present operation of the French army, alongside soldiers from half a dozen West African countries, let's remember they all arrived at the express wish of the current and presumably interim president, Dear Kunda Touré, who was formerly the leader of the National Assembly. Yes, France has a colonial past, a neo-colonial present. Yes, France has vast economic interests in the Sahel, notably uranium in Niger, and it has an aid policy which over the decades has kept these countries poor and powerless. Yes, of course, the US is desperate to safeguard future oil interests in Africa. And yes, as everybody said in the earlier session, the imperial wars of Iraq, Afghanistan and Libya have been absolutely catastrophic in their destruction of states and society 
They constitute war crimes, and those responsible should, of course, be in The Hague. I want to mention one person in particular who hasn't been mentioned because he's to do with Libya. I'm sure many of you know about the great French intellectual called Bernard Henri Lévy, who single-handedly went to Libya, said, this is a very important revolution, went back to Paris, persuaded his great friend Sarkozy that it would be good for his Sarkozy's future election coming to be Mr. Big <coughs> in North Africa, and the rest is the history that you know. And yes, finally, the French intervention in Mali is risky and may fail in any number of ways. But France is not America. And they have said they will come out soon, and they may do so. But I want to stress that this series of events does not fit neatly into the simple pattern of those imperialist wars that we all um, or mostly agree on. I've outlined this zone of lawness and the influx of jihadis and all of that. I'm sorry, I'm just going to go on for a little bit more. I haven't quite finished my five minutes, am I? Um, <laughs> because I want, I want to stress that, unlike um, everywhere else, the population in northern Mali, those of them who are still there, are totally in favour of the, the French and the other soldiers and the Malian army, fragmented and chaotic as it is, as you know, they're already fighting today. And of course, it's Sanogo's guys who are fighting the others. Um, and the question is, can this intervention succeed? And I want to very briefly tell you what it would mean for it to succeed. If this breathing space works, it, Mali could get back its dignity of Modibakaita's time. It means a major effort from Bamako, for a new deal for Azawad. It means overt prohibition on inter-ethnic revenge killings. It means a transformation of the political class to reverse the moral collapse, which puts Mali at 118 of the 182 people in the Transparency International Index of Corruption. It means rebuilding a Malian army that is Malian, as it was until Musa Traore's coup destroyed it and it means reversing the seduction into AFRICOM. You have US troops in 35 African countries. Mali should be one of the first to step out of it. It also means changes of policy from Europe and France in particular, accepting that immigrants from Africa come to work in Europe when their own economies are not providing jobs. They work hard, they send their earnings home, and they only want to go back they don't want to be here. And my final point is, don't mistake the importance of what Algeria means in all of this. The events in southern Algeria at the BP station of Inaminas was nothing to do with what was happening in Mali. It was an entirely fortuitous event by a how shall I put this politely, a jihadi Mokhtar ben Mokhtar who <laughs> had separated himself from the various other jihadi groups in southern Algeria <coughs> and he wanted his 9-11 and he invented this very sophisticated concept which fortunately went completely wrong. It was not a revenge for Mali, that was his clever portraying of it and I just put into the mix that part of the misportrayal of this was done, of course, by media in quite a sophisticated way. A Mauritanian news agency that no one had ever heard of before or since was the one who gave airspace and interview time to the leader of that, not Ben Mokta himself, but the, the actual leader who is now dead. I can't go on, although I would love to, but it's my friend's turn. <laughs> Campaigner. Thank you. Our friends, so my campaign, I'm going to make one request before I make my brief contribution. This is the second time I've seen a power session on Africa. We're going to stop the war event 
and we've not had enough space for people. I think that what it means is that there are a lot of people who are interested in this question of Africa. If people are interested, I think that then it means we can also take some action. I request of everybody who is here today, that if you can give your contact so we can mobilize on the question of stopping proxy war in Africa. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, Victoria and myself may differ in our analysis, but I think that we both agree that the situation in which a foreign country will have to move troops into another country is not the best way the world should be. <laughs> the history of what we are seeing in Mali today has been totally a product of the West's relationship with the African continent. The um, people who are in northern Mali and southern Mali were not together. They have all been on the African continent, that's true. But there have been different groups and there have been certain relations between those groups in pre-colonial and colonial times. Between the 18th and 19th century, the Arabs and Tuaregs have been known to have made slave raids down to parts of West Africa, including what is southern Mali today. So that meant that there was a relationship of suspicion at the time of so-called independence. And when these countries were being created without the involvement of the African people, the Tuaregs, for example, requested that they should have their own country with all the Tuaregs together instead of Tuaregs being split between uh, Burkina Faso Niger, Mali, <coughs> Algeria, Libya. That means that <coughs> at independence already, the way the countries were put together was impregnated with um, disaster, a situation I refer as proxy war. And it actually touches almost every African country. Even in the situation of Somalia, where people speak the same language with one dominant religion, they managed to divide it between the Italians, French, and Britain. So there will be a proxy war on behalf of three European powers. <laughs> and this is the situation that Africa was faced with. With the Berlin War, the Berlin Conference laying a foundation for countries. I've been telling people when it I go to Northern Ireland that if you want to understand what's happened in Africa, imagine that you have 54. Um, Belfast, and then you can be able to understand what is happening, or 54 uh, Northern Ireland. Um, the, so when this situation was created, it meant that in most African countries, I, the forces that pulled together were less than the forces that pulled apart. Because for many of the sub-nationalities, they had connections outside the border. For example, I'm an Ewe. Oh, five minutes no, no, no. Oh, okay. I'm an Ewe. <laughs> <laughs> the Ewe's have been split between Ghana, Togo, Benin, and Nigeria. Accounts, Ghana, Ivory Coast. So people have connections. So I always say that the century Peter forces are less than the centrifugal forces. And that's the kind of situation that we have. But, even after independence, the Western interference continued. Uh, Modibo Keita, who became the president of Mali at independence, was a progressive leader, a Pan-Africanist. And when Mali became independent, he broke away from the French community and built closer relations with Eastern Europe. Because of this, it created a situation where the Western intelligence forces we're working against people like Modi Boketa, Sekuturi, Nkrumah, because that time they had also created the Ghana Guinea Mali. But Modi Boketa and others were involved in the All African People's Conferences in Accra, Tunisia, um, Tunis, Cairo, 1958, 1960, 1961. 
1961 conference adopted a resolution on neocolonialism and resolved that the African people should mobilize with their friends against neocolonialism. It was agreed that in 1964, there will be a conference in Bamako, Mali, to discuss, to, a decision, to take a decision on how to prosecute the struggle against neocolonialism. Then in 1962, between the, la the third All African People's Conference and the expected fourth All African People's Conference, there was a first, supposed first Tuareg rebellion, 1962. <coughs> what happened? 1964, the <coughs> Modi Wuketa couldn't host that conference anymore because of the interferences which were going on. And finally, Modi Boketa even went back to the French community with them in 1967. But when the Western countries take a decision, they are meant to carry it out. In one year, after 1968, he was overthrown by Musa Traore. And the IMF and the World Bank became deeply involved after the overthrow of Modi Boketa by Musa Traore. So that is a kind of situation that we had with money. I know there's going to be a lot of time, so I'll rush for maybe we'll have time to have discussions during question time. Then, at present, there is this whole thing about the uh, so called terrorists. In fact, if Akeda in the Islamic Maghreb is at the base of this, first of all, Akeda itself was created by the West actions in Afghanistan. So, and then when you come to some of the people who have involved in Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, have been trained in Afghanistan as a result of the West proxy war against Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And if you remember, in 1991, when the Islamic Front won the election in Algeria, and the Islamic military, in collusion with the West, decided to cancel the elections. Later, records have it, uh, during question time, we start out to look for quotes, that the Algerian intelligence infiltrated the Islamic Front. When they infiltrated the Islamic Front, I think there was a, a group which emerged as the general, okay, the, another, a group emerged. And actually, Akeda in the Islamic Maghreb is a shoot off from the group which emerged in the, in the, in the, in the, during the work of the Algerian intelligence work in infiltrating these groups. So these groups have been created at every stage by the West. So what happens is that the West creates these groups and then says that they are going after them to maintain <laughs> peace. So have an excuse of going for the resources of these countries. The, in 2007, the US came up with the Africa, the uh, US uh, African Command. But just before that, they have had all manner of programs which are preparing the ground for Africa. For example, there's the Trans-Sahara uh, Counter-Terrorist Initiative, Trans-Sahara Counter-Terrorist Partnership, all which involve money. So, and Canada also had increased its uh, amount that it puts into money. So what, from, me, from my analysis, what was happening is that the all scramble for Africa was being consolidated with North America, that is US and Canada being invited to the table, with the US now becoming the senior prefect in the scramble. And that is why there has been so much involvement, and also the threat of the Chinese, who have started building all kind of relations. Uh, the African Union invited Iran and Venezuela to its, uh, most of its, some of its recent meetings. All these pose a kind of threat to the, the, the West <coughs> to have an interest in, in moving in. And then, when it comes to they trying to secure the situation, look. The coup was staged by, um, well, after the coup, everybody was saying that there's a coup d'etat government. 
the, the coup d'etat government is behind the kind of government that you have in Mali today. So there's a duplicitous way in which the West is intervening. I will admit that people have talked about certain weaknesses in, the, uh, in Mali. But I think that we have to look at solutions in a better way. One, African, count, African people all across Africa, I think that Africa has to unite to face this problem mm -hmm. squarely. Mm -hmm. African people all across Africa mm -hmm. should put pressure on their governments mm -hmm. so that their governments will be able to stand up to external forces. Then, solidarity movements like here should put pressure on the Western government to stop interfering. Yep. Then, we should organize grassroots groups who should be able to put pressure and direct the affairs in the African countries and come together as a united force. When come together as such a united force, we'll be able to put up an African high command, which will not need an I, uh, a, a, a U.S. AFRICOM to enter Africa anymore. The fact is that it's been a struggle. And there are various ways in which the West intervenes. That's why the Soviet movement here is very important. One, it's not only this fiscal intervention. They also make sure that various groups, which are progressive groups, Victoria was talking about my past. We will not go into that here. And how I've survived and why I'm alive, we won't go into that today. <laughs> but the West have actively participated in making sure that those who would want to push Africa in the progressive direction are eliminated. Even in the West here, when people, the proxy war continues here, when people even working in various places, even with NGOs. Um, I know a friend, uh, Joseph Apira, who was working with Refugee Council, Refugee Council of all organizations. And then she was kicked out of her job because it was alleged that she is with one faction of the war in her country, whilst the West also continued supporting, financing another faction. Uh, and so we have to ensure that we build a kind of campaign movement in this country which will be able to pressurize the West to stop these type of interventions. The other thing is that there are a lot of front organizations which appear as NGOs, human rights, animal rights organizations. Mm -hmm. But if you go to Google, if you do a Google search, you see that these organizations are front for mercenary organizations that have been created mm -hmm. as mercenary organizations. All this is a task. There are things we may not be able to physically stop armed forces going, but we'll be capable to stop some of these things if we mobilize as a movement. Mm -hmm. I think that. Talk, the talk is cheap and it's easy to talk but there are actions that we can take and I always tell people the world we live in has not always been like this it's been shaped by human beings and it's we human beings again that will be able to change it and that's the task of you and I We've got a uh, Stop the War's got a protest next Friday outside Downing Street at 5.30 against intervention in Mali, which I encourage if you can all get down there. And it's not everyone here is from London, but if you aren't from London or not far away, you can come down to that. It'll be really important. It's going to be the first, I think, one of the first protests against Mali, the intervention in Mali in this country. So um, I'd just like to take um, some questions and contributions. Uh, can I see anyone who'd like to? Um, the Stop the War Coalition. Until, I left here 2010, but until 2009, every Stop the War Coalition had had a resolution on proxy wars in Africa, until 2009. Um, in fact, the Stop the War Coalition had organized on Somalia. Um, Congo, we used to have even day schools in SOAS. And any time that there was a problem, I don't know what has changed since 2009. But any time that there was an issue on wars in Africa, in SOAS, starting from SOAS here, African students were in the forefront organizing such meetings. And we've organized things on Congo. Uh, I remember the first um, session on a Stop the War meeting that I ever addressed in 
SOAS was on Congo. Uh, we actually had an organized uh, Somali group here. There was Sister Dahabo and a number of people, I will not remember all the names now, who were addressing sessions in, in fact, the last international meeting which we had, uh, Dahabo Ise of Somalia spoke. So I think that what has happened is that something has happened between 2010 and now. And that is why when I started, before I said anything, I asked for people to come, <coughs> give their contact details, so that we can continue from where we were in 2009, as far as I knew. I'm not in Ghana, I'm not here, but the issue of privacy was, was on the agenda of the Stop the World Coalition. Um, we had meetings in Glasgow, Nottingham, um, Sheffield, uh, different places in London. In fact, uh, Hamas Smith, a full of Stop the World Coalition, where I used to be the chair, we had so many meetings on Africa. And so the Stop the World Coalition's record is not as bad as it's being painted. But maybe something has happened over the last two years and we have to, we have to correct it. The, the solution is not to, um, you see, people go out to campaign on things which they are interested in. That's when I saw the number here. I said the people in this room are interested in campaign on Africa. Can everybody give their contact details? Then we'll be able to mobilize people and work. Uh, actually, the only way to solve the problem is to act. Because I should speak louder than words. Um, my name is Kevin. I'm a criminal lawyer. I also work with, it's as loud as it can get. I also, <laughs> I also work with Brother Exeter Nanny Kofi on a, on, a, on a show, a radio show called Another World is Possible. Every, uh, every Tuesday, 7 to 9, where we give a platform for African voice across the diaspora from the grassroots up. And it's the grassroots that c concerns me. Um, there was a suggestion I made. I, I want to respond to that because I think it's so important what's been said. I completely agree with the importance of the concept of proxy wars. And it's a particularly important, as has already been mentioned, in Somalia. But I also agree with everything that he said about we must listen to the grassroots. I want to ask you, in the grassroots, in Mali. The people, did anybody welcome these bands of criminals that came in and transformed their lives? No. People fled, people hid. This was what, what came in was not something that was indigenously a political Malian movement. And this is kind of like the central point of everything I tried to explain why this is different. The, I defy you to find a grassroots woman in particular in Mali who was happy about what happened. What happened was young couples got killed for walking down the street together. People got their hands cut off. Read, read all there is, and there's a tremendous amount, if you, anyone who reads French, there is so much about what actually happened. So when you con condemn the French and the other neighboring countries for coming in, what was the alternative? Do you want to just leave it and allow Northern Mali to become something completely different from what Mali has always been? Africans are capable of solving their own problems. But show me, show me any imperialist okay. intervention that had a positive effect. Yeah. I, can I Just say, show me this. I said it may well fail, but the, it's not the same as Afghanistan and Libya. I've made my point. It's not okay. the same. A couple more contributions. Um, from France. I'm Nathalie from France. Nathalie from France. It's true, I mean, in France, uh, we have had discussions uh, on that in a number of organizations, and it, it, who, which one? Is that one is okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, I'm Malcolm Bryant, I'm a teacher, so I hope you can hear me. <laughs> um, I think we've got to be clear about who the enemies are, and I, and I say enemies. How much I agree with uh, what Hamza said about we face a false choice between <laughs> dictatorship and imperialism. 
what is needed, as he said, is to, and I think I also said earlier on, is to build strong national states. And if we in a solidarity movement have any modest role to play in that, let us do it. But actually, it's not our show. And we should be humble and stand by while they do it. And I would just like you to reflect on Algeria as a strong state with many, many contradictions. I'm not saying anything, like I'm not making a false choice here that I'm with the, the regime. I'm just saying you have a strong national state and it's one of the few that remain. And whoever it was who said there may be an intervention in Algeria, don't bet on it. The Algerians are the toughest and the most likely to be able to craft something that repels imperialism. Um, I think that I'll come back to action. Uh, we've done a lot of talking. Um, I was very happy to hear Victoria saying that where in case of solidarity, we should let them do it and let's stand by and do the most well that we can do. I'll not say why I've said that, but I'm sure she will understand it. <laughs> uh, the, all those who want to be involved in doing something, I know the Stop the War is going to take initiative, but I want to involve in getting people who want to do something now. So anybody who wants to do something on this issue of Africa, please give me your phone numbers here and now after this meeting. And we'll take it up from there together with the Stop the War. I'll be going back to Africa. But like I said, we have to organize the populations all across the continent to do something about this. In fact, when 15 February 2003, when I was here, I wrote, there were Stop the War coalition groups in Africa. And they were more interested in the demonstration about Iraq, Palestine, and whenever I raised the issue of proxy war with them, they were not that enthusiastic, even on our own continent. And that's why I felt, I felt that some of us have to go in there as well. And I was surprised that they, when I left here, the resolutions of proxy war vanished from the South the World Coalition resolutions as well. I'm here now, and I want people who want to do something here and now to come to me after this session. Um, as I said, talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. So those who want some action, come to me after this, and we'll take it on from there. Can I just make a proposal that you get someone else to take Yeah, that's right. It's OK. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you want to do it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and uh, okay. Okay. And uh, and the last one. I remember your question. Now, last one. Last one. In terms of what to do about corrupt, uh, repressing governments in Africa, the mass of the African people will be able to deal with it. And in fact, for some of us, that's what we've been doing our whole life. And that's why I had to spend 27 years away from my place of birth and I've returned and continued from where I left off. So I'm here today. Those who want to do something here, put it together. I'll be back to the continent in March, and we'll link up those of us on the continent and those who will be in the solidarity movement here. I'm sure we can build a very big movement together with the Stop the War Coalition. I have confidence that the Stop the War Coalition, which was able to mobilize 2 million people, is capable of mobilizing 2 million people in Africa as well. Uh, last week announced that, that he is prepared to wage decades of war on Africa. I think that makes it clear why.